Acts chapter 14, verses 21 through 23 say this, And when they had preached the gospel to that city, and had taught many, they returned again to Lystra and to Iconium and Antioch, confirming the souls of the disciples, and exhorting them to continue in the faith, and that we must, through much tribulation, enter into the kingdom of God. And when they had ordained them elders in every church, and had prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord, on whom they believed. Now, what I want to preach on is the subject, ordained them elders, ordained them elders. In this sermon, I'm going to explain what the Bible teaches about how to become a pastor, who is qualified for being a pastor, and where that pastor's authority is valid. Now, let's get started here. The reason why I'm preaching this sermon is because it has come to my attention that there are two schools of thought on how a man becomes a pastor. There are those on this end of the spectrum who say that only a pastor is qualified to choose another pastor and that you have to go through a pastor to be ordained by that man to be the next pastor. And if you don't go through a pastor, it's not valid. Then there's the method over here that has congregational ordination, which is basically when the congregation comes together and decides who's going to be the pastor, and they lay hands on that man, and he becomes the next pastor. Now, I'm going to explain to you in this sermon that there is much more biblical support for the idea of congregational ordination than there is for the idea that one pastor chooses the next pastor. In fact, there's hardly any biblical support for this school of thought. So let's get started here. What we see in these few verses that we started off with is church building, discipleship, and ordaining pastors. In verse 21, it says that they preached the gospel to that city, they taught many, then they returned again to Lystra, to Iconium, and to Antioch. So they didn't just knock the doors of Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch, and then, okay, that's it, we're done. We got these people saved. We gave them the CD for, you know, whatever our favorite preacher is, and then we just said, okay, that's a wrap. No, they went back. And what did they go back to do? It says confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith. If you want to build a church, or if you want God to use you to build a church, you have to have follow through with the people that you get saved. That is step one. You have to be able to, not only did I get that person saved, but I came back later to check on their progress and make sure that they're living a godly life. And if they're feeling weak, strengthen them. That's what the word confirm here is talking about. Because something that's firm is sturdy. It's hard. It's unmoving. Hey, is your Christian life shored up? Are you living for God? Are you learning how to get the sin out of your life so God can use you? But in a lot of churches where they emphasize soul winning, which is a good thing, they de-emphasize follow-up, and that's a bad thing. You have to have both the soul winning and the follow-up. Don't abandon the one for the other. So it says, confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith. And it talks about, you know, we much through much tribulation enter into the kingdom of God. So I guess after they got them saved, they maybe gave them like the, you know, after the tribulation. I'm just kidding. Anyway, let's continue. And when they had ordained them elders in every city, I'm sorry, in every church. Notice, ordain them elders in every church. It doesn't say ordain elders to every church. And there is a difference there. And let me explain what the difference is. When you ordain an elder in that church, you're choosing from those people and you're having so, ha, they're having someone be ordained from within that group. That is different from when a pastor says, okay, I'm a pastor in Arizona. I'm going to ordain you and send you to Texas. Well, you're not ordaining that person in a church in Texas. You're ordaining them in a church in Arizona and sending them to Texas. That is not the same thing. It doesn't say they ordained elders in a city and sent them to a different city. It doesn't say they ordained an elder in church A and sent them to go start church B. No, they went there and started church B and then had someone from there be the elder of church B. That's how it works. It's ordination from within, promotion from within. And the reason why it's so important to do it this way is because what if you're part of a church where the pastor steps down because he's disqualified himself 
or he's retiring, or he has an illness and he steps aside to let someone else take over as pastor. Well, if you have a method that says, well, we can only accept an ordination from a previous pastor, then in that case, if he never ordained anyone to take his spot, then you're pretty much stuck. Or what if your pastor dies? Well, I guess we'll just have to pack it in and go to a church where they already have a pre-existent pastor, even if he's preaching wrong. We're just going to settle for it because we want the formality of having a man with a title on his wall. No, that's not how it works, folks. What happens is ideally that pastor is training up the men of his church so that when he steps down or if he dies, then the next man, they can just lay hands on him and continue and things go the way they should. So that's actually what the Bible teaches. They ordain elders in the church, not to the church. Because if I'm a member, I'm going to just pick, if I'm a member of church A and we ordain this guy in church A, well, we've ordained him, but he's still a member of our church. If I tell him, now that we've ordained you, you know, from church A, you have authority over church B, then you know what that's indirectly saying? That's saying that church A has authority over church B, and that turns it into a denomination, and eventually that turns it into a cult, and that's not a safe direction to go in. That's why you get stupid things like, you know, grown men saying that they're an Andersonite, which is ridiculous because the Bible says not to say that you're of Paul or of Apollos and what have you. And so when you have this model that says, okay, we sent this guy out to start that church, well, why do the guys in church A have say-so over who church B's pastor is? That's That defies the doctrine of the churches being local and independent. And that's why if they're truly going to be independent, then church B is started on its own. You know, People go out and start Church B, and they promote from within. That's the biblical model to do things. I'm further proof of this, I'm going to go all the way further into Titus chapter 1. <clears throat> Look what it says in verse 5. And you just get there very quickly. In Titus chapter 1, verse 5, again, we see evidence of what the Bible teaches. It says right here, For this cause left I thee in Crete, that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting, and ordain elders in every city as I had appointed thee. It says ordain elders in every city. You go to that city and choose the elder. You're not in a separate city. You choose an elder in this city and then just send them over there. That's not a scriptural model of doing things. And when you do things that way, well then, if I received my ordination from a congregation I no longer belong to, and I just come over here, and because I have that sheet of paper, I now have authority over you, well then guess what? I'm not accountable to you. Even though you're my church, you're the church I preach to, I'm not accountable to you because I got my authority from an external source, not from you guys. And you see, that doesn't make any sense. And that's how you get churches where the pastor is basically running a dictatorship. And if anybody questions the pastor's decision, he can just blackball them or blackmail them, kick them out or something like that without any kind of recourse. I have sat in churches where the pastor has said, if I kick somebody out of the church, you don't question it. You just go along with it and don't fellowship with that person. How is that scriptural? Even Jesus talked about before you count someone as a heathen or a public and you take them before the church. Or even Paul said, set them that are least esteemed in the church to judge, you know, between brethren. So the church as a whole is supposed to judge on issues of whether or not someone gets kicked out. The pastor doesn't just have carte blanche blanket authority to be able to say who's in and who's out of the church. Now, if the pastor sees that a wolf is coming, he can bring it to the church's attention, and then the church makes the decision to cast the wolf out. That's how it works. But this whole idea that the pastor just, well, because I received my authority from my sending pastor, I can come over here and have absolute authority. It's a dictatorship. You just do everything I say. That's not the scriptural model. Now, further proof of the fact that the Bible does teach congregational ordination, which is when the church as a whole has the authority to lay its hands on a man and have him be pastor is actually found in the Old Testament in Ezekiel chapter 33 verses 1 through 7. It says, again, the word of the Lord came unto me saying, son of man, speak to the children of thy people and say unto them, when I bring the sword upon a land, if the people of the land take a man of their coast and set him 
for their watchman, if when he seeth the sword come upon the land, he blow the trumpet and warn the people, then whosoever heareth the sound of the trumpet and taketh not warning, if the sword come and take him away, his blood shall be upon his own head. He heard the sound of the trumpet and took not warning, his blood shall be upon him. But he that taketh warning shall deliver his soul. But if the watchman see the sword come and blow not the trumpet, and the people be not warned, if the sword come and take any person from among them, he is taken away in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at the watchman's hands. So thou, O son of man, I have set thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore thou shalt hear the word at my mouth and warn them from me. So notice, in the very beginning of this passage we read here in Ezekiel 23, the people took a man of their coast and set him for the watchman. After they set him for the watchman, then God holds him accountable for whether or not he preached the truth. God holds that watchman accountable. So the process goes. The people come together, they pick a watchman, and God holds that watchman accountable. But guess what? If God is holding that watchman accountable, that means he's recognizing that watchman's position as the watchman. He's recognizing that watchman's position, his authority. So that's how it works, is that the congregation comes together and makes a decision on who the watchman is. It's not that if a previous watchman appoints the new watchman, then I will hold that watchman accountable. No, the people of the coast get together and they choose the watchman. Now, some people like to say, well, this is not using the phrase pastor, so therefore it's not a valid reference to how a pastor is ordained. Or they'll say, this is the Old Testament. They didn't have pastors back then. Well, if you look at the duties of this man, he is warning people from the Lord. He is warning people how to get their life right. He's exhorting the people to serve God so that they don't get God's curse upon their life, so that they don't get destroyed. How is that different from the duties of a pastor? These duties are very similar, if not identical, to the duties of a pastor. And as for that doctrine that they didn't have pastors in the Old Testament, pastors are a New Testament-only concept, I'd like to introduce you to a prophet by the name of Jeremiah who just blows that doctrine out of the water. Look what Jeremiah says in chapter 3, and this is Old Testament, mind you. You had people in the Old Testament whose job it was to preach to the flock and warn them from the Lord. That's not exclusively a New Testament concept. Yes, you no longer have Levitical priests because we all as believers are priests, but the Bible says nothing about whether or not the office of pastor just sprung up in the New Testament. Look what it says in Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 15. The Bible says here, And I will give you pastors according to mine heart, which shall feed you with knowledge and understanding. I don't see how that's any different from when Acts chapter 20, verse 28, the Bible tells the pastors to feed the flock of God. It's the same kind of language. It's the same duties. You had Old Testament equivalents of pastors, folks. This whole idea that pastors just popped up in the New Testament, I don't think that that's a scriptural doctrine. Anyway, go, let's go all the way to Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 1 and 2, because we have, we have Ezekiel, we have that first reference in Jeremiah. Let's do a second reference in Jeremiah, because a three-fold cord's, three three cord's not quickly broken. Woe be unto the pastors that destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, saith the Lord. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God of Israel against the pastors that feed my people. Notice these pastors are feeding people. These are preachers. You had preachers that were called pastors in the Old Testament, folks. Let's continue. Ye have scattered my flock and driven them away and have not visited them. Those pastors who don't like to do follow-up. And, you know, you have a lot of pastors like this like to scatter flocks. Notice what it says. And have not visited them. Behold, I will visit upon you the evil of your doings, saith the Lord. You have pastors like this. I've sat in their church where they like to scatter the flock. Oh, you're not in lockstep with everything that I say? You're a reprobate. Oh, you don't agree with how I do church? You're a rabble rouser. Oh, you don't agree with every little decision that I make? You're a railer. Oh, you don't like Jack Hiles? You're a railer and you're not qualified to show up at church. You, I mean, and I've seen this, for example, in the Andersonite movement where they are so quick to label anybody that they don't like a reprobate. 
and it's ridiculous. They'll say, oh, well, this guy once made a mistake in his sermon. He misspoke. Ah, that's proof he doesn't have the Holy Spirit because he's a reprobate. Or, for example, when Bruce Mejia said in a sermon, he said, everybody that I've ever gotten saved knows about the Trinity, and if they don't know about it, they're not saved. That's such a dumb thing to say. Now you're adding the work of understanding the mystery of godliness to salvation. Now you're preaching a salvation that's believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and understand the Trinity and thou shalt be saved, which is a ridiculous thing to preach because you had people in the New Testament who had never heard of the Holy Ghost after they believed, but then they heard of the Holy Ghost and he came upon them. And even the most important scripture for salvation says, you know, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. It just mentions the father and the son in that verse. I'm not... To saying that to take away from the Holy Ghost, because obviously the Holy Ghost is who seals us, and there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. That much is obvious. But when you say that if somebody doesn't, under, doesn't understand or know about the Trinity that makes them not saved, that is ridiculous, and that is a false gospel at that point. But you see, they're so quick to say, oh, well, this person made a mistake in their Trinity doctrine. They're not saved. They're a reprobate. I can't wait to see them burn in hell. And then they use that as an excuse to hate their brethren. They're scattering the flock. And you know what you're going to see with these churches, I believe? You're going to see people leaving them. You're going to see more division. You're going to see more scandals come out because these pastors are putting the spotlight and scrutiny on others in the church and trying to focus on them because they want to draw away from their own secret sin. Well, God knows about it. And if you don't fix it, God very, God very well may find you out someday. But the point made here is that in the Old Testament, they had pastors. In the Old Testament, God expected those pastors to do a good job. God did not want those pastors to just play around with his flock. Now, some of you might be asking, well, can you show me in the Bible where it says that a church has that kind of authority? Because you see, you're probably thinking in your mind, well, the way we've been doing it is that the pastor is the one that, you know, that exclusively has that authority. But you know what? Here's the thing. That's more in line with like how the Catholic Church does things. You know how the Catholics think of the pastor as a priest? And in the Catholic Church, only the archbishop has the authority or the charisma or whatever to be able to choose who the next priest is or to be able to choose who the next bishop is. And so that whole, you know, it takes a pastor to know who's qualified to be a pastor, that's Catholic doctrine. If you're a Baptist, you should run away from that like the plague because that's not how our Bible teaches. That may be in their, you know, lectionaries and in their catechisms and whatever, but we have the King James Bible and the Holy Spirit and that is not what we believe. Look what the Bible says in Matthew chapter 18, verses 18 through 20. It says, Verily I say unto you, Whatsoever ye shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever ye shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again I say unto you, that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. So he just said that we as believers can get together and make decisions and God will hold us to that decision. Isn't that the exact same process we saw in the book of Ezekiel chapter 33 when the men, of the, when the men got together and chose a man of their coast to be the watchman? It's the same idea. If you have the Holy Spirit inside of you, then God is giving you that power to judge. God has given you that power to choose leaders. But here's the thing. You want to make sure that you're reading your Bible and that you're right with God so that you have the proper judgment to choose a good leader. Because if you have improper judgment, you're going to only look on the outside appearance. You're going to be a respecter of persons and choose a wrong leader. And that can lead you down a negative path. Now, I just wanted to throw a quick aside in here about this. I just wanted to quickly explain what counts as a church. Because of course, we know that there's the greater sense, you know, husbands love your wives, even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. And the church there, I believe, is referring to all believers in general. But we as all believers are not all going to be congregated together until we get to heaven, until Christ comes back, gathers the dead in Christ, you know, gathers us up and raptures us. And, you know, that's not that's when we're all going to be as one giant church. We're not that yet, but we will be someday. That's, you know, up in heaven. But right now, 
what counts as a church. Well, look what the Bible says in Acts chapter 20, verse 28. It says, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. Notice the word flock and church are used interchangeably there. What is a church? A church is a group of believers that get together for the purpose of serving God. Because think about it, as a Christian, I'm a sheep. Because the Bible says that I'm a sheep, I know the shepherd's voice, he's given unto me eternal life and I'm never gonna perish, right? Well, I'm a sheep because I trust in Christ. You trust in Christ too, you're a sheep. What do you call it when a bunch of sheep get together? It's called a flock. And I'm not talking about where, you know, the sheep are just together for this moment and then they scatter and they're just bounced around. If you have a group of believers that regularly assemble for the purposes of serving God, that is a flock. And if that's a flock, then according to the Bible, that's a church. It's that simple. If you had a group of believers that decided they're going to assemble together and they're going to serve God, that's a church. And if within that group they chose a qualified man, then that's a church with a pastor bam, there you go. It's that simple. No need to send them off to Bible college to go get pumped full of Zionism. No need to send them off to seminary to go get pumped full of dispensationalism and Calvinism. If you have the Bible and the Holy Spirit and you're doing the Berean test, you know, searching the scriptures daily, whether those things were so. And if you doing the Berean test, you could notice that what that man's preaching is right. You look at first Timothy three, you look at Titus chapter one, he's living it. You have, and, and if he desires the office of bishop, you have cause to ordain him, and there you go. That's a pastor, that's a church. It's that simple. It doesn't take all of this calculus of, oh no, what if I move? Because here's a problem the idea of, you know, well, it, it takes a pre existent pastor to choose the next pastor. What if that pastor dies? Or worse yet, what if he gets corrupted in his doctrine because he becomes like one of the seeds sown among the thorns? where the deceitfulness of riches and the cares of this world choke him and he's unfruitful, his judgment's compromised. Therefore, he might actually start attacking God's flock rather than feeding it. And a, an example of this, even though he wasn't a pastor, he was a king, would be like King Saul, for example, where because of his sin, God's blessing removed from off his life. And rather than building up David as his successor, he was trying to squash David. How many of these pastors have you seen? You go to them, wanting to learn from them, wanting to work with them. And because you're not exactly what, they, what they're looking for, they just turn you away. That's, you know, that's not scriptural, folks. But let's actually look at some practical examples. We'll look at some more examples of actual people being ordained or having hands laid on them. Almost every example I have seen of hands being laid on in the New Testament is a group doing it, not a pastor. Acts 6, 5 through 6. And the saying pleased the whole multitude. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch, whom they set before the apostles. And when they had prayed, they laid their hands on them. They, they, they. It doesn't say, and when they prayed, the pastor came and laid his hands on him. Laying on of hands is a group project. It is not a single person task. That's, that's how it works. Unless you're talking about like the Old Testament where Moses, of course, was using was you know choosing Joshua as his successor, but that's a different scenario because Moses wasn't a pastor in the exact same sense of the New Testament. Now let's continue here. Acts chapter thirteen verses one through three. It says, "Now there was, and now let's actually talk about this." It says, "Now there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers, Barnabas and Simeon." that was called Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene, and, Man and Manian, which had been brought up with Herod, the Tetrarch, and Saul. And it says, as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, separate me Barnabas and Saul for the work wherein I have called them. So the Holy Ghost wants Barnabas and Saul to be ordained, not as pastors, but for this particular work that they're doing. And notice, and when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away, 
ordination's a group exercise. It's not, okay, well, the pastor wants to send that guy out. I guess it'll happen. It, it doesn't work like that, folks. So the point is, a church is a body of believers who get together for the purpose of serving God. Ordination is done by a group. And all of these examples I've shown you are groups of believers ordaining someone. I, I'm, I'm having a hard time finding a single example of where just one man who just, he's the one that does the ordaining. Now let's talk about who is qualified to be a pastor. We went to Titus chapter 1, verse 5 initially. We're actually going to go back to Titus because I'm going to cover this very briefly, and I figured if we were already in Titus, we might as well go back. Go back to Titus chapter 5, but now go down to verse 6. If any be blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of riot or unruly. So notice, who's qualified to be a pastor? Husband of one wife. He's married. He's got children. He's a man. No female pastors. I'm sorry. Females may be used in other duties. Titus, if you as a woman want to know how you're supposed to serve God and preach and teach, go to chapter two, because chapter one's not for you. Go to chapter two. Chapter one is not for you in terms of your leadership skills is what I'm getting at. Chapter two is the one directed at you ladies where you're to preach and teach to other women. You're not preaching and teaching to men. But notice, the bishop must be blameless. Now, what does the word blameless mean? To make a long story short, the word blameless means that you don't have any obvious major sin that is on your reputation that is staining it and making you unfit to serve God because you don't have enough contrast with the world. Now, let me actually prove that by going, let's go back here a little bit. And I'm going to actually go to the book of Philippians, chapter 2, verse 15. It says this. It says that you may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke. So blameless means without rebuke. It means there's no major sin I can point to in your life and say, oh, I, I rebuke you. You're not doing anything that's worth rebuke. It says, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation among whom ye shine as lights in the world. Blameless means if I compare you to the world, you shine as a light. If I look at your lifestyle and I'm having a hard time telling the difference between your lifestyle and the lifestyle of this unsaved person, you're not shining as a light. You're not blameless. Blameless means that there is an obvious and stark contrast between how you're living and how the world's living. If you're not in your Bible and you're not praying and you're not treating your wife right and you're not being attentive to your kids and you're not raised, if your kids are running around talking like the world and acting like the world, looking like the world, got sad news for you, you're not blameless. Part of whether you're blameless is how your family life is going. Part of how you're blameless is whether or not you're treating your wife. You got all these pastors, they have the nerve to get up and want to go travel the world and preach to other people, leaving their wife and kids behind, not, not paying attention to their wives, neglecting their kids. Well, guess what? I don't care how strict you are. If your kids associate church with the back of daddy's head leaving, they're going to hate church and they're going to go astray. I don't care how tight your doctrine is. Don't believe me? Solomon grew up listening to David's sermons and David wrote the longest book in the Bible and Solomon grew up listening to that preaching and he still turned out to worship false gods when he got older. Now granted Solomon was saved but Solomon went astray and I believe that that was because his dad failed to set a proper example but that's a whole nother discussion but the point is that if you're going to be a pastor you need to make sure your personal life is in order. It says for a bishop must be blameless as the steward of God not self-willed. He's not in it for himself. I don't care what the Bible says. I'm going to do it my way. Don't be self-willed. Not my will, but thine be done. You should be saying to God. Not soon angry. If you were to take this not soon angry, most of these new IFB pastors would probably fail that test. Because if you question them just a little bit, you're a reprobate. You're a Jews is scary. You're not soon angry. Honestly, unfortunately, a lot of them are just not qualified, but that's, anyway, not given to wine because the Bible says, look not thou on the wine. No striker, not given to filthy lucre. So you're not violent and you're not just in it for the money, but a lover of hospitality. You let people into your home. You build those people up. Or wherever you are, you know how to be courteous as a guest, you know, as a, as a host to your guests. A lover of good men. 
Because the Bible talks about how excellent it is for brethren to, brethren to dwell together in unity. You're a lover of good men. You love to see people doing right for the Lord. Your whole spiritual life is not obsessed with, let me go look at what pastor out there is preaching something I don't agree with, and let me go make my next sermon about him. No, you don't have time to look at all that because you're loving the people around you. As a pastor, you must be able to build the people around you. It says, sober, just, holy, temperate, holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and, conv and to convince the gainsayers. There's some gainsayers out there. We need to convince them. If somebody comes to me and say, if, if a believer comes to me with bad doctrine, I'm going to try to convince them. I'm not just going to throw them away as a rabble rouser, as a reprobate Judas Iscariot creeped in. And you see, that's one of the things I think is a flaw of the new IFB. Because they're correct about the post-tribulational rapture, they think that that gives them license to obsess so much over the end times that they almost get paranoid and think that everybody that's not exactly in lockstep with them is a reprobate Iscariot, Judas Iscariot creeped in. That's the wrong direction to go in, folks. You must be a lover of good men. You must con want, love them enough to want to convince them how to be right when they're in bad doctrine. If I were pastoring a church and one of my members came to me and said, hey, I'm having a hard time with the Trinity. I'm starting to fall into modalism. I'm not going to say, well, you were never saved. Get out. I'm going to explain to them. I'm going to be like, hey, the Bible says these three are one. God is three, yet God is one. God's both. Don't go over here to the extreme where you make God just a simple organism that's not complex, you know, like how modalism does, because Jesus did say the Father is greater than I, but at the same time, don't go over here and go to this extreme where, oh, it's three separate bodies and spirits and minds and wills, because now you got three gods. You know, I've noticed that some people, they, they're a little too tritheistic, and here they oversimplify and dumb down God. You need to come back into balance with that and realize that we will never fully understand it, but these three are one. I would try to convince that person that was falling into modalism, not just, ah, you were never saved, get out, you're dumb. No, I, I don't believe that that's the scriptural way because you even had the Galatians who were foolish and got bewitched. So let's get to the last part of the sermon where I explain where that pastor's authority is, where is his jurisdiction. It's so simple. 1 Peter 5, verses 1 through 3, then we're done. The elders which are among you, I exhort, who am also an elder, and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind, neither being as lords over God's heritage, but being examples and samples to the flock. So, where is that pastor's authority? His authority is in showing the example to the believers. He's not a lord over them. If you're a pastor, you don't control your congregants' members' lives. Like, you have some churches where, oh, any major decision you make in your personal life, you got to get the pastor's permission first. Or, for example, there was a church that I left. I told you about I left this church because... The pastor was bragging about how he beat his one-year-old daughter until she stopped crying because she was in her crib crying, and he beat her until she went to sleep. He was like, yeah, you got to break that will. And this pastor was letting people in the church tell perverted jokes about him spanking their wives, and he wasn't correcting them. And I was like, ew, is this some sort of weird sex cult? I'm getting out of here. And the pastor was just a jerk. You know, I'll give you an example. Here's why I left this church. So, you know, the... Those were reasons enough right there. Well, another thing was that, you know, I had to work during one of the days that they had a night service. I had to work on that same day. As soon as I got off work, I uh, went to the soul winning time that was before the service. But I had to leave the soul winning time a little bit early because I had to go pick up my wife and kids so that we could go to the night service. So naturally, when you have to pick up you know, your kids, sometimes you may have to change a diaper. Things aren't always that fast. You might get there a little late. I showed up at church a little late. This jerk had the nerve to say, if you don't know how to show up on time to church, then you're a babe in Christ. And I will not ordain someone who doesn't know how to show up to church on time. You know, uh, he didn't mention me by name, but he obviously directed it at me. I'm thinking, whoa, you're not a lover of good men. You're soon angry. 
this kind of, you're a striker because you're beating your one yard. I just realized that this man just was not qualified. So I left this church. I stopped going there because I noticed, you know, there are only a few people going anyway because the Holy Spirit's not, I don't believe the Holy Spirit's on him or blessing his ministry because he's so self-willed. Anyway, members from that church eventually started knocking doors in my neighborhood and they got to my door and one of them tried to pretend like he did not recognize me, but I got out my Bible and I was like, oh, cool. You're out soul winning. Let's go together. Let's go out soul winning. This man said, you have to ask our pastor first before you can go out soul winning with us because you left church and you haven't come back in a while. You have to talk to him first. And I said, show me in the Bible where it is in the pastor's authority to do that or to make that decision. And he couldn't he couldn't show me where it was. He just turned around and walked away and said, I don't have time for this because they get so caught up worshiping their pastor that they don't realize that they should be worshiping God. You see, the pastor is not the Lord over the flock. He's the example. His jurisdiction is not over that man's wife. His jurisdiction is not over that man's personal life. His jurisdiction is how he leads the church to live godly. And it says, feed the flock of God, which, which is among you. If that pastor goes and guest preaches at another church, he's not pastor for the day. He doesn't have authority over that flock. He has authority over the flock that has chosen him, the flock that is among him, not a satellite church or anything like that. Like this Jonathan Shelley guy who got mad at Adam Fannin because, oh, well, he won't submit to everything I want to do. Well, guess what, Shelley? You abandoned your flock at, at Houston like a coward, and then you have the nerve to want to take over steadfast, Fort Worth, and then say, oh, the guy at Jacksonville won't listen to me. Ah, bam, I'm going to cry like a baby. No, the flock of God, which is among you. Those people in Jacksonville are not among you. I bet you've never met most of them. They're not your flock. The flock is among you. Care for those you preach over. Love those that are with you. Care for those that are around you. Surround yourself with a strong support system and be a support system for the people that you surround yourself with. If you want to be a pastor someday, you need to be in your word, you need to be in your prayers, and you need to serve God, and you need to learn how to love people and feed the flock of God, which is among you. God bless.